Good evening, Dr. Andy Rosenfarb here. I want to welcome you to another session of our bi-weekly talks. Today we're going to be talking about can COVID accelerate your vision loss? So let me get our PowerPoint started here and get my screen share going. And without further ado, okay. So that's tonight's subject. Can COVID-19 accelerate your vision loss? There are some things we need to be concerned about for those who are dealing with either acute or progressive vision loss. And we're gonna talk about that this evening. Uh, if you have questions, please post them inside the comments and we'll do our very best to get to them. If I do not get to them on this call, I will get in there and jump in and answer your questions. You're also free to call or email us or post inside our group uh, if you have any questions. So let's get going. Okay, so we all know that we're dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic right now. Uh, this is some information according to the CDC that you may or may not be aware of. So right now we know that uh, the COVID-19 is the same coronavirus, it's in the same family that caused the SARS outbreak in China in 2003. Uh, this strain of virus is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That is the actual virus which leads to the COVID-19 disease process, similar to how we have HIV and AIDS. HIV is the virus, uh, AIDS is the effect. So this is kind of like how, how they uh, differentiated that. Uh, it's also been observed that over adults and people who have uh, severe underlying uh, medical conditions like heart or lung disease or diabetes, uh, people very overweight, um, people have what, call, what we call comorbidities. That means they have other significant health issues uh, are going to have more problems. They're going to have a harder time. Their body isn't going to be as resourceful uh, in terms of fighting off the COVID and their recovery may be compromised. So anybody who's having really a hard time with this does have these comorbidities and other health conditions. Um, we know it's spread mainly through close, through close contact, uh, through water vapors, through breathing, through, uh, you know, kind of touch and contact and stuff like that. That's why we have six, six feet of distancing. You know, everybody's wearing these, these masks and stuff like that. Um, you know, you come into to, uh, restaurants or, or stores or clinics or something like our clinic, we're checking everybody's temperature. You know, we check the forehead, make sure nobody's got a fever. Uh, the other thing that you might not be so aware of is we're doing pulse oximeter, oximeter, okay? So what pulse oximeter does is it measures your body's oxygen levels through the SpO2. So this is a good device that you may want to keep around your house, you know, if you're kind of concerned or, or in your work or anything like that. We pretty much just have our patients come in, you put your finger in, and it assesses your oxygen levels in your body. And we look for people who are dipping into the 80s. Most people we found are between 96 and, you know, 90, 98%, even up to 90, 90 uh, you know, up in the, the high 90s. Um, so this is a really good way to, to look at your oxygen levels. And we're gonna talk a little bit later uh, about why that's useful, but in short, the effects of COVID are they cause hypoxia, all right? The, the, the COVID virus causes systemic hypoxia or lower oxygen levels in the body. Um, the body basically suffocates. So uh, early detection, right? Checking temperature to see if there's a low grade fever, um, any other symptoms we're asking people that were also the best test that I like is really checking oximetry. Um, you could get them in any grocery store um, or most of the pharmacies have them now. You can get them online. But that's my favorite way to test. Um, we're still learning a lot about this disease, uh, about its, its spreading and everything like that. So uh, that's the problem. The testing isn't so great. Uh, the numbers aren't super accurate right now. So we're really just kind of doing the best we can. Um, the main effects of COVID-19 on the body are the two biggies that we're really looking at are systemic inflammation and blood clotting, okay? The COVID disease causes the blood, the red blood cells in the body to stick together and form blood clots. Now, those of you guys who, who know a little bit about health um, and medicine know that blood clotting is not something that we want inside the body, all right? Like the only, we want clotting if what, if we get a cut, right? If we get an injury or we have something going on where, where there's, there's a bleeding episode, we want the bleeding to stop so the blood has this capacity to clot, right? That's what blood does to, so we don't lose our blood and we form like a, a clot and a scab and of course 
uh, we, we don't bleed anymore. Um, the pathology inside our body is, you know, our blood starts sticking together and the blood cells clump together. We can have things like a stroke or an embolism or, you know, any of these, these, these clotting disorders um, that, that sit in the body. It's not good. You know, it could throw a clot to your brain, to your lungs, to your heart, cause a heart attack. Um, these, are, these are real dangerous situations. So especially people who are at high risk for stroke, uh, diabetics, people with heart disease, um, people who smoke because their blood is already dried out, people who drink a lot of alcohol, who run dehydrated, um, people who don't, aren't, don't drink a lot of fluids. Um, that's what we say. We're going to talk a little bit more about this later, about things like smoking or you know, we have to keep hydrated and we want to keep the blood from clotting. So that those are things that, that these are like after effects. So uh, they, they, I mean, these, these things can kill you, uh, but they can also, if they don't kill us, they can do some harm, even long-term effects after we have COVID. So we know it obviously activates the immune response and our, our immune response, uh, you know, we get infections, we get a fever, we get inflammation, we get uh, respiratory distress, we get fatigue, anything that's like, you know, like a bad flu virus. Um, or even pneumonia. I've had some, some friends and patients and colleagues who've had COVID-19. A lot of them say it feels like a really bad case of like pneumonia or bad bronchitis or the flu. Um, dehydration always comes with viruses and infections, right? Colds, viruses. Uh, the effect is that's why we always drink a lot of fluids because we want to keep ourselves hydrated because as our body heats up, it uses more fluids. So not only do we want to stay hydrated, but we want to flush the, uh, the virus out of our system and any of the waste products, the metabolic waste products that come as a result of our body fighting this battle, right? There's a lot of casualties in the, the name of viruses and, you know, white blood cells and, and tissues in the body. There's a lot of cells that die, so we got to kind of wash that out. Um, respiratory inflammatory distress, right? We know that this causes, you know, uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, stuff like that. We know that it causes hypoxia. We just said a little earlier that COVID-19, guys, this is the most important thing you guys need to know. It is a disease of hypoxia. Hypoxia is low oxygen. That means the body is suffocating, all right? Our whole body, the body suffocates because why? Because A, it attacks the respiratory system so we can't get the oxygen into our body. We also have what? This clotting, all right? The red blood cells, what they actually do these red blood cells that are clotting is they flow freely uh, inside the circulatory system, inside the capillaries, the, the, the veins, the arteries to distribute oxygen throughout the body. Now, if these blood cells start to stick together and clot, we don't have oxygen carrying capacity throughout the body and therefore we suffocate. It's basically the whole body strangles uh, because we don't have oxygen. It's like, oh, you know, we're choking ourselves off. So we need oxygen, right? You know, we know we could go for like a couple of days without food. We can go, you know, maybe a day or two without water, but we can't go long without air, right? Air is the most important thing. It's like three minutes or two, three minutes. You know, the brain doesn't get oxygen. The heart doesn't get oxygen. So um, oxygen is the real big player. Again, oxygen, inflammation, blood clotting. And then what happens when we get this this disease and it really starts to overtake us. If our immune system isn't resilient, we get this thing called a cytokine storm, which you're gonna talk about in a minute. And if that overtakes our body and overwhelms the body, it can definitely lead to, you know, in, in a few small cases of organ failure and even death. Fortunately, I think that's like 0.4% right now of, of contracted cases. So, um, you know, I think it's like 2% of people are the last research I read. And again, the research isn't so good, um, there's a lot of like undiagnosed diagnosed cases, and um, it's, it's a little uh, unclear about the, the actual metrics that are going on right now. But we know that fortunately, there, there, there's a lot of people getting COVID, but um, it seems not to be uh, as, as um, deadly as we thought. Although, unfortunately, you know, it is, uh, seems to be impacting, again, people with comorbidities, uh, people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s seem to be, actually the 70s and 80s and 90s for whatever reason seem to be doing a little bit better with it. Um, maybe they're just a little more isolated and um, who knows, but of course we know that things like the assisted living and nursing homes, um, senior centers have been hit the hardest with, with the COVID uh, disease. So let's talk a minute about the cytokine storm. So what is a cytokine storm? This is important for you guys to understand. The cytokine storm is a severe immune reaction which the body releases too many cytokines into the blood too quickly. 
all right? Cytokines, what they do is they play an important role in normalizing the immune response. Um, but having too many of them released at once uh, can be very harmful, very inflammatory. Uh, we need them, but what happens is it's like a flood. It's like the body just floods with all these, you know, those, these cytokines. And again, it's not that the cytokines are bad. It's just in the quantity, in the amount of their being released. It's like this, this just, it's like a forest fire that, that, that just takes over. You guys heard about forest fires that have like kind of gone through last year and the year before or two years before that through California. Um, and then a couple of years ago, Australia was dealing with this. So there's like brush fires that just like, they're just out of control and they just burn everything. They just break everything down. So cytokine storms can occur as a result of infections, autoimmune diseases, other disease processes. They also occur after treatment of some autoimmune therapy. Um, signs and symptoms include high fever, inflammation, redness, swelling, as you might imagine. Uh, the sequela or after effects are a lot of fatigue nausea, draining, it wipes you out. It's like, it's like having a really bad hangover. So we've gone through this, this disease and um, you know, it's, we've had this huge cytokine storm and all this inflammation, it's caused dehydration, it's caused oxidative stress, um, it's caused acidosis in the body, it's, it's caused more hypoxia, more carbon dioxide and more metabolic waste to build up. Our lymphatic system is, is kind of overwhelmed by, with the detoxification process. So you know, sometimes cytokine storms can be uh, severe. Uh, you know, most of the time we get sick, we deal with them. But in certain cases, again, with comorbidities and, uh, you know, people with heart disease, cancer, pre-existing conditions for, uh, for stroke and heart disease, uh, it can be life-threatening and lead to things, again, like organ failure. Um, so this is just something I want you guys to be aware of in terms of the mechanism and how this happens. Um, if you want, you guys can do uh, your Google, Google searches or go online, learn more about this. But I think that the cytokine storm is one of the most relevant things to understand in terms of the, you know, pathophysiology of, of the uh, COVID-19 response and how our body responds to it. So some of the long-term effects, so we know we're learning about that now. So we know some of the early warning signs, people get fatigue or low grade, we know the sense of smell. Uh, decreases in some people. And then we just talked about the cytokine storm which people become actively infected and they're sick and they're exhausted. They got this chest pain and can't breathe and just wiped out and kind of feel real fluish. Um, but then again, there's this aftermath, right? There's this, this kind of like, um, like after the forest fires have burned, what are we looking at? So uh, they're starting to collect data on that. And we're seeing just like with any other flu uh, bronchitis, I dealt with um, West Nile virus about 16 years ago, 17 years ago. So I personally have experience with sequela, sequela or uh, after effects of, you know, of these big viruses. So uh, a lot of the things we look at are things like ME or chronic, chronic fatigue and exhaustion. It, guys, it just wipes people out. Long-term shortness of breath, neurological and cognitive issues. I was reading a research that's showing that people who go through COVID, their IQ actually drops 20 points. So it really has an effect. It fries your brain a little bit if we don't control the inflammation. Um, stroke, embolism risk increases, heart attack risk increases because of the, the clotting, because of the, the, the inflammatory processes and increases the, the, uh, the likelihood of ischemia. Um, again, that's heart attack and, and things like that, cardiovascular disease. We're increasing risk of cancer. Why? You got two things happening. So after this, the immune system has been taxed. So the immune system has dropped a little bit. We also have hypoxia. And this uh, German researcher named Otto Wahlberg in the early 1900s did won the Nobel Peace Prize. Not, blah, 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 I can't speak today. The Nobel Peace Prize for finding uh, and sourcing research that oxygen can't grow in an oxygen-rich environment. So we're not saying that it's, you know, it's the cause of cancer for, in all, you know, broad spectrum, but we know for a fact, um, based on Otto Wahlberg's research, that cancer grows in a, in a hypoxia environment where there's low oxygen in the body. So increasing oxygen volumes will, uh, can help the body overcome cancer. It can stimulate the immune system. We're going to talk about uh, oxygen therapy a little bit later as a possible, um, you know, uh, supplemental treatment for, for this type of situation. Uh, of course, we know, again, there's the lowered immune system, uh, things like anorexia, because people are tired, they're not really eating, they haven't eaten much, their body's burning up a lot of glucose, so we kind of lose weight, and our appetite's not so good, so we get this, like, not like, 
you know, we get anorexia from just burning too much fuel from dealing with this. And then our appetites, so people like eating soup and crackers, if that, um, again, who wants to eat when they're sick? So our fuel, our, our raw materials to repair and regenerate uh, is not where it needs to be. That's why getting back on a healthier diet, um, yeah, starting with soups and stews and things that are easy to digest, maybe juicing uh, is a good idea, to way to, good idea of a way to work our back towards uh, health. So let's talk about our vision. That's why we, we jumped on this call tonight, right? How can COVID-19 accelerate vision loss and how does it affect our vision? So we talked about some of the, the factors uh, in the previous slide. We're talking about local or systemic hypoxia. So if we have systemic hypoxia because of the blood clotting uh, that's going to impair the blood flow, we can have uh, also local hypoxia where the, the blood vessels start to collapse or break down, or we have little clots going on throughout the body where the blood cannot circulate to the eye or throughout the whole body for that matter. And again, low blood flow means less oxygen delivery to each cells and tissues and organs of our body. You guys may not remember this, but the eyes, we're going to talk about this, I mentioned this a couple times because it's really important. The eyes are the highest oxygen consuming tissue in the whole body. They are so sensitive to oxygen fluctuations. You guys learned that in our last session two weeks ago. We talked a lot about how reduced oxygen, either from anemia or blockage of the blood vessels, or again, with COVID-19, things like blood clotting reduces the oxygen carrying capacity. So low oxygen, low carrying capacity, hypoxia states in the body are gonna directly impact the vision. How do we know that historically? I'm really glad you asked that question. So here's the, uh, here's the thing with that. So uh, with cases like retinitis pigmentosis, Stargardt's, these, these eye conditions that are not so age related, I've been, you guys know I've been working with patients for over 20 years. So here's a phenomenon. Women who have a lot of these eye conditions who are of childbearing years uh, get pregnant, have children, and then after they give birth, they tend to experience about 50% of women with these uh, degenerative conditions who have children will experience some decrease in vision. Sometimes it's short term, sometimes it's permanent. The re one of the main reasons for vision loss postpartum after they give birth is because of the loss of blood, okay? Loss of blood leads to what? Anemia. Anemia is what? Reduced or subpar volume of blood. Too little blood in the body, can't transport the oxygen, right? Can't transport the oxygen. Peripherally, our body takes care of our organs first, and then our periphery, our head, our hands and feet second, all right? So it wants to warm the organs because they need the vital organ, or vital organs need the oxygen first. If there's enough, it's going to send it to the hands, feet, and head, which is our periphery. So if there's anemia and not enough oxygen in the body, or there's a, a reduced a, available amounts of blood due to things like clotting, we're going to experience vision loss or maybe acute or progressive accelerate our vision loss. So again, the blood clotting reduces the oxygen to the eyes in the brain in COVID-19, uh, which also goes for other viruses like SARS or um, you know, any other viruses that, that have been uh, West Nile virus, which isn't as big right now. But even things like bronchitis or pneumonia, it's all the same pathology, guys. So we need to, to look, at, look at this. Uh, inflammation, we know dehydrates. Uh, it, it can actually roast the blood vessels and take them from these nice, flexible, squishy pipes like garden hoses to rigid rusty pipes like you can see rusty pipes so it breaks them down from these soft garden hoses to these rusty pipes that break down and have holes in them so the inflammation also can accelerate progressive vision loss in a lot of cases we know a lot of eye diseases that we deal with both both acute and degenerative and progressive are rooted in systemic inflammatory processes so if you guys want more on that, you can go to YouTube, our YouTube page, and learn, at our pa learn about our patient education videos. Inside those, we talk extensively about the role of inflammation and the types of inflammation and how it affects our vision, and then things you can do to manage inflammation. We'll talk a little bit about that later as well. So inflammation leads to dehydration. Dehydration is reduced fluids, water in our body, right? Water, like in our cars, uh, helps our cooling system. Water puts out fire and it helps keep our body cool. So it's not just water. We need electrolytes, the right amount of electrolytes. 
Um, a little bit of sodium, not too much sodium because too much sodium we know can rise blood pressure, but things like magnesium and potassium. So we get a good electrolyte supplement that acts like mineral salts to help uh, the, the fluid stay in our body. That's what happens. The best they give us when we're in the hospital is what? A bag of fluids. You know, when I was in the hospital 17 years ago with uh, West Nile virus, I was on fluids. I was on painkillers, pretty much caffeine and, you know, ibuprofen and fluids. That's all they really had. There's no, no, no real treatment for that at the time. So dehydration is a big issue, right? So we want to make sure that uh, if it's severe enough, we might need, you know, IV fluids, uh, if it is not, then we need to make sure that we're drinking enough water, enough fluids. We're also paying attention to our electrolytes. Uh, so the other thing that happens is a result of these processes, it, it taxes our body. And when we tax our body, we have a process called oxidative stress. A lot of you guys have heard the term antioxidants that counteract oxidative stress. So antioxidants will help with this, but we have this oxidative stress, which is accelerated aging. In Chinese medicine, we call this the burning of the Jing. The Jing is like our inherited trust fund of health energy, if you will, that we're, build, that, that we're born with. So we're born with this quantitative amount of energy, uh, health, life force energy that we, uh, that we come here, went to, that we get from our mom and dad, and uh, things like diseases, poor lifestyle, injuries, stress, uh, poor diet, um, for women, childbirth, for men, excessive ejaculation will tax and burn the jing. So uh, disease like COVID-19, dealing with that and getting sick will also tax the jing. And as the jing declines, we have uh, accumulation of oxidative stress, which is accelerated aging. Uh, the result of that as well is mitochondrial impairment, where the ATP uh, production, which is our body's energy, um, modern interpretation of what we call qi in Chinese medicine, or qi in Japanese, or prana in Ayurvedic medicine. So this ATP is, is the energy that animates us and, and basically uh, distinguishes plants and animals from the non-living. So it, it, that's basically our qi factories, uh, the mitochondria inside the cells, for you guys remember cell biology, what it does is it produces our energy. So when we get sick, we have oxidative stress, inflammation, viruses in the body. It impairs and stops our mitochondrial uh, from producing energy. So we have low energy. Uh, we're more susceptible to disease process, repair, and recovery as well. We talked about blood clots, right? We can throw a clot not only to our eyes, to our brain, to our heart, to our young any, uh, lungs, anywhere in our body. So blood clots are a real big risk. We're going to talk about how to deal with that a little later. Um, things like impaired met metabolism and detoxification pathways through the liver, through the bowels, through the kidneys, the intestines, through our skin, through our lymphatic system. The whole body gets broken, starts to break down. Uh, the kidneys, we've seen a lot of renal issues with COVID-19. When the lymphatic system gets backed up um, because it gets dried out, right? Think of a sewer, right? Or, or, or a sewer pipe. So uh, when there's not a lot of water, or think of a river, like a riverbed in like a third world country. So if there's like a lot of sewage and, you know, maybe human waste or animal waste coming through a sewer, if there's not a lot of water there, it kind of sits, you know, and it gets kind of like a, like, a, like a swamp. It gets, you know, stinky and smelly and everything. And what happens is it, it accumulates disease, right? It sits there, it's acidic. Uh, there's an old saying that, you know, uh, swamps don't attract, uh, flies don't attract swamps. So what it is, is the acidosis, the oxidative stress, the breakdown of waste, of, of organic waste start to attract uh, bacteria and, and flies and you know, everything to help assist in breaking that down. So if our blood sludges and it becomes more acidic and more diseased, our lymphatics are more diseased, and we don't have this, this, this cleansing process because the rivers become you know, low and toxic, uh, it, it, diseases arise, it happens in our body. So we want to increase the hydration, you know, get a good flushing system, really, really important. That's why we, we have bags of fluids and that's what we drink a lot and things like chicken soup. Um, and we also, you know, really need to monitor anything that's going to counteract that. So again, we want to really, uh, it was so great. I mentioned this twice, a little typo, <laughs> typo there. So we know it's accelerated oxidative stress. Um, and it just, again, it just exhausts our body. It tends to tax are already weak areas, which, you know, for people with eye conditions, 
uh, if you have a uh, you know, predisposed eye condition, it's going to attack that area. If you have joint pain, your joints are gonna hurt more. If you have irritable bowel syndrome, it's gonna mess up that system. If you're prone to migraines or you're prone to um, you know, digestive issues or headaches or allergy, whatever it is, when our body gets taxed, we deal with diseases like COVID-19, it's going after our weakest areas, which in this case happens to be uh, the vision. So let's review from last time. So we talked about three systemic factors that rob your vision, poor circulation, inflammation, oxidative stress. With COVID-19, again, we're looking at poor circulation as a result of blood clotting and inflammation, drying out the blood and causing blood clots. Also the inflammation amplifies that negative effect on the body by further drying the body out, causing the cytokine storms. The aftermath of that is a result that we call oxidative stress. So I didn't highlight or bold the oxidative stress, but that is gonna be the consequence or the, the, the byproduct of the inflammation and the blood clotting and poor circulation. So let's review this slide real quick. This is a review from last time. So again, I just wanted to remind this, it's very relevant here, blood flow to the eye, critical guys. Deliver oxygen, nutrients, remove carbon dioxide and waste. The retina, again, is the highest oxygen consuming tissue of the body. No oxygen, no vision, no life too. So like we can survive, the oxygen levels will, will, will you know, decrease, but we can still function, right? But the brain function is going to decrease. Our immune system is going to decrease because oxygen is required to generate new uh, monocytes and white blood cells that help fight disease. So low oxygen and hypoxia is really putting us at, at greater risk. So again, oxygen is, is critical here. Um, so what can you do so you don't get it? Let's, we're going to talk about three phases now. Prevention, what we do when we deal with COVID, and then uh, what we deal if we've had COVID trying to recover. So prevention, let's look at a couple uh, strategies here. Wear a mask. Hope you guys are all doing that when we're out in public. Um, you know, there's, you, people have different opinions on it. Uh, I get that. Um, excuse me one second. I hooked my, uh, my mask on my glasses here. Thank you. <laughs> so wear a mask in public, in public. Um, social distancing, wash your hands, of course, warm soap and water uh, for 30 seconds to two minutes, minutes, 30 seconds, two minutes is recommended. Um, so we want to, you know, really watch that. Uh, at home, not such a big deal. Um, managing stress. Why? Because stress, as we know without question, drops our immune system. Um, yeah, good luck now with all the, the craziness that's going on with COVID, but do your best. And what does that mean? So um, we're going to go into stress in another section that we do, another, another conversation we have. But generally speaking, we're talking about stress. I'm going to invite you to consider that we have two things that we, that we look at when we're dealing with stress. We have th or three things, actually. We have the things that really don't react don't cause us reactions. Uh, those are neutral, things we don't know about, things that aren't really relevant to us. And then we have our black holes, which are suck the energy out of us, trigger us, they get us stressed out. They, you know, you guys know these things, all these things in our life that stress us out and cause us uh, stress and anxiety and depression and worry, and they just suck the energy out. We call those black holes. Stay away from black holes. Identify them and just stay away from them as much as possible because they take your energy away, and, which includes your immune system identify your batteries. Your batteries are the people, place, and things and environments that charge you up and make you feel good. So real, real clear way to do this is check in with your feelings on this. Do I feel good? You know, to feel charged up, feel energized when I'm dealing with these people, or do I not? If not, they're a black hole, if, or they could be neutral. If you feel good, you feel positive, you feel energized, you feel happy, spend more time with your batteries. It means, in, you know, check your environment, Check people you're talking to, watch, watching the news, usually a black hole, right? Social media, unless you're not in a, a group that is befitting of your beliefs, philosophies, and ideas about what's going on, don't go looking for stress. Don't go looking for, th for things that are going to upset you. There is plenty of that out there. So um, have a fast to take care of yourself on uh, negative information, okay? Exercise. A little bit of exercise goes a long way. Something every day. Research shows that exercise dramatically increases immune system. Uh, it's going to help with circulation. It's also going to, um, you know, reduce stress, which we talked about. Uh, strengthen your immune system. You know, there's there's a lot of ways to do about to go about doing that. Um, again, keep stress down. Keep hydrated. Uh, reduce alcohol, smoking, junk food, and stimulants. Why? This dehydrates the body. 
increases inflammation and creates more acidosis. More acids is gonna render you more susceptible to infections. Certain supplements for prevention that we're recommending for patients are things like vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin C. I like liposomal vitamin C, minimum of 2,000 milligrams a day. Liposomal is easy on your stomach. You guys could check that out on, uh, on Amazon, lipospheric liposomal. They come in little packages. They're cased in fat. So the, light, the vitamin C uh, usually gets broken down in the digestive system. This liposomal product takes it right to the liver where it can be used systemically and you don't lose like 80% of it in your digestive system. Vitamin D, recommending minimum of 5,000 IU, up to 10,000 for people a little bit more immune compromised. Zinc, quercetin, um, those are two bigs that have already been reported to be useful uh, in COVID. Uh, we are recommending our Canavision product, which is a very, very high potency CBD, CBA. I had no uh, realization or understanding of its implications on the immune system until I personally took it. Um, some of you guys have heard this already. I, uh, my constitution is pretty weak on my immune system. Since childhood, I have gotten sick, gotten colds, um, every time the flu comes around, I pretty much get it every year. I'm good for like three to four colds. Um, those of you guys who, you know, my students have seen me teach half the time I'm out there. I'm either recovering or just ca catching a cold. Since starting Canavision, I have not been sick. And this is about 13 or 14 months now. I haven't had a sniffle. I haven't had a cough. I haven't had an allergy attack. I usually get spring allergies. So I am, at, I'm using this for myself. I have my family members on it. Um, well, we talked a little bit about the, the CBD. We have both the, the tincture, we have the, uh, the gummies available. So a lot of people don't like the taste and you know that, that can be a factor for some people. Also pre and probiotics, right? Gut flora, intestinal flora is key. That is where our immune system uh, is formed. So really, really important to, uh, to have a prebiotic and a probiotic, right? Your intestinal flora. What do you do if you have COVID? You've just, you had an exposure, somebody checks your temperature, you get your blood test, your oximeter levels are going down, you're below 80 uh, or below 90, you're looking in the 80s, you got a low grade fever, your doctor suspects that you may have COVID. Of course, you got to quarantine for two weeks, that's what we're asking people to do. Um, the key here is we want to manage the cytokine storm, which is the inflammation, the hypoxia, and the blood clotting. Inflammation, hypoxia, blood clotting. Those are our big key factors we want to look at. Rest, right? We have to rest in quarantine. Hydrate, electrolytes. If you're going to the hospital, <coughs> they'll probably put you on fluids. If you're at home, electrolyte drinks. Pedialyte, get on it, buy a case of it. Just, you know, just, just take that. But water too, don't take just Pedialyte, but Pedialyte and water, Pedialyte and water. Um, I'm a big fan of the Kangen water because it's more alkalized water. Um, supplements, um, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc. Um, there's a lot of medications that are out there. They're questionable, um, but it, it, it's, it's, you know, there's some people say it's working. Some people say it doesn't work. Um, I'm not really going to comment on that right now, but <coughs> hydrochloroquine is, is one. Uh, we're looking at uh, um, some antibiotics. Uh, they talk a lot about zinc. They talk a lot about uh, quercetin, vitamin D. So there is stuff out there um, we're going to see what happens with the vaccine. Um, that's kind of a, a touchy subject for a lot of people. Um, but again, going back to the supplements, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, Canavision, probiotics, prebiotics, stuff like that, quercetin, Chinese herbal medicine. There's a lot of research coming out of China. They're having fantastic results, not only for keeping the immune system strong. Uh, once you get COVID, there are Chinese herbal formulas that they use for SARS in 2003 when the SARS epidemic was, was huge. Chinese herbal medicine was incredible. It was great in helping manage. Now, is it going to cure it? No, it's just going to help manage the inflammation, help manage the cytokine storm, the hypoxia, and blood clotting issues. So again, protolic enzymes, keep the gut health. And then we are go if you are in COVID, hyperbaric oxygen, guys, is my opinion from what I've read so far, this is going to be huge. Um, if you have it, talk to your doctors. If you're not in the hospital, and obviously if you're kind of like, you know, kind of dealing with like severe um, COVID symptoms, you have to deal with that first, right? We have to get yourself uh, monitored. But the patients who have gone through hyperbaric oxygen, the majority have incredible, incredible relief and full recovery. 
So what they're doing is there's actually research going on right now in Louisiana, NYU is doing research. Uh, there's a big research study going on in Canada on a hyperbaric oxygen right now. Um, we are actually looking at getting a hyperbaric oxygen chamber for our clinic. Um, I'm meeting with some, some people next week about it, not only for uh, some of our patients who are dealing with sequela of COVID, um, also for patients who are dealing, the more I'm researching this, I'm finding out about the benefits of for vision in general. So not only are we gonna be using it for, for follow-up for patients who are dealing with COVID, you know, they're looking at over half the population possibly getting this thing. That's a lot of people dealing with the aftermath of COVID. So hyperbaric is a real big thing. Um, side note, I have been actually consulting, I'm gonna talk more about this on another session, but I've been consulting a company called Careplanes that's just getting their, their business off the map. They're actually doing the study in, uh, in Canada right now where these guys are taking, because here's the, here's the, here's the problem, folks. There are just over 4,000 hyperbaric oxygen chambers in the world right now. That is not enough to serve people, individuals. So hyperbaric oxygen chambers, if you're not aware, they kind of look like coffins. <laughs> They're like these tubes. They're either plastic or hard, uh, uh, like a blow-up plastic type of thing, like a, like a bounce house that people kind of go and sit in for about an hour, or they have the medical-grade versions, the higher-end clinical versions that are a big hard chambers um, you guys heard like Michael Jackson used to use them. A lot of celebrities are sleeping in them now. Justin Bieber uses them all the time. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad if you're a Justin Bieber fan. But look, Hollywood is using this for anti-aging, for a lot of health, for things like autism, um, post-stroke, diabetic, wound healing, cancer. So hyperbaric oxygen is coming up fast, guys. In my opinion, it's going to be a real big thing that's coming up in, in the future for uh, health prevention, health treatment, and is definitely a big player with not only prevention, but treat COVID treatment, um, but also gonna be, uh, as we're gonna see in a minute, it's gonna be very, very valuable for people recovering from COVID treatment. So again, with these guys, with the care plane business is doing, they've taken this, this problem of lack of hyperbaric oxygen chambers around the world, and what they've done is they're taking airplanes because airplanes are actually already giant hyperbaric oxygen chambers. <laughs> Excuse me. And what they've done is they've had technology to where they're taking uh, uh, technology and they're making these airplanes into large scale hyperbaric oxygen chambers where you can get anywhere from 10 to 300 people on these giant 747s. They're going to pipe in the oxygen, the hyperbaric oxygen. So you're going to be able to just go on these planes. You know, if you can't find a clinic or you can't find a place that's offering hyperbaric oxygen, these are going to be mobile treatment centers that are going to help people to recover. So um, if you guys want more information on that or you're interested, feel free to reach out to me. I will be talking more about that. But that, that company is called Care Planes, and I've been consulting them uh, probably for the last two months. Great, great people. Um, these are really uh, good, good people who are just really um, out there to, to help uh, help save lives. You know, their, their, their model is to help save, you know, millions upon millions of lives uh, if this, you know, this COVID is a thing. You know, we don't know how bad it's going to get yet. It's certainly cost, uh, you know, the world millions of lives already. So we don't want to see that happen. We talk about, um, you, know, you know, the amount of, of people who could potentially get this thing before we reach herd immunity is what, 5 billion or something like that. So again, be on the lookout for hyper, hyperbaric oxygen. Look more about, look more into it. Um, it's a thing. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the biggest players coming down, uh, time, especially for rehab. Um, so what do you do if you've had COVID? You've had it, you're home, you recovered. Uh, maybe you had low grade. Maybe you're in the hospital, hospital, hospital intubated um, with you know respirators and stuff like that. And you're just dealing with all this aftermath, scarring, inflammation, just feel like crap after it. So again, rest and relaxation, hydrate, light exercise, stretching, get the body moving to move the lymphatic system, help clear everything out, strengthen your immune system, no alcohol, no smoking, junk food, have a clean diet, get rid of smoking, like any of these habits that are going to dry your body out or be pro-inflammatory, just at least for a little while, just, just put it on hold. You know, you can go back to your, to your fun afterwards, but now you really need to focus because this could be like long-term sequela that you guys are dealing with. Um, Acupuncture, again, Chinese herbs are amazing functional medicine. Uh, you know, therapy, if you're kind of dealing with, you know, some people need occupational therapy or physical therapy. 
Uh, but for sure, things again like acupuncture, Chinese medicine, functional medicine are going to be super useful. Uh, supplements like, again, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, uh, cannabis, CBD, CBA, probiotics, uh, protolytic enzyme. Now, with CBD, if you guys are like kind of have your own things that you like, a lot of people use Charlotte's Web and other companies, that's fine. But here's the thing you want a full spectrum CBD. I recommend CBD with CBA. Um, the thing with this is you, my recommendation is I want patients, adult patients should be getting a minimum of 1500 milligrams a day. That's 1500. I'm sorry. A hundred, just erase that 150 milligrams per day. It's not 1500, 150, 150 milligrams a day of CBD. So with the Canavision, that's roughly two dropper folds. So look at whatever you're taking, whatever CBD full spectrum, that means it has everything in it. Full spectrum CBD, make sure you're getting 150 milligrams per day. For children, we cut that dose in half. Um, for cases who've had, kids usually aren't really dealing with COVID, so it's not such a big deal. But for pre prevention, we're putting kids on about 50 milligrams, 50 to 75 milligrams per day. Um, so that's how we're doing it. Recovery, again, hyperbaric oxygen is going to be one of the best things to accelerate recovery from COVID-19 uh, sequela and the convalescence that people are dealing with. So the goal here is to, if you have prevent yourself from getting COVID-19, we talked about those strategies. Uh, if you get it, we want to deal with it as fast as possible to deal with the inflammation, the hypoxia, the cytokine storm, if you've had it and you're dealing with recovery, uh, we talked about those strategies. Um, there are real, real concerns for people with pre-existing eye conditions that it can accelerate your vision loss. So doing these, these, these uh, implementations that we talked about that you can like use, these tools that you can use, supplements, nutrition, hyperbaric oxygen, um, anything to get the body, even things like, guys, there's like Wim Hof method, that are breathing exercises that help increase your oxygen levels in your body. Um, there's a lot of ways to get the oxygen. If you can't right off the bat get to hyperbaric oxygen, so do some research. Again, uh, one of my favorites just for a daily exercise is Wim Hof method, W-I-M-H-O-F-F. -F. Um, he's the, Google him up or read up on him. It's called the Iceman. Uh, amazing guy, like combines yoga with breathing, with ice baths. Not for everybody, but the breathing exercises are rooted in yoga that help oxygenate the body. I'm a huge fan. I practice this myself a couple times a week. So there's a lot out there for you guys. If you have any questions, um, you know, we invite you to, again, please comment, reach out, call, email, text, uh, post inside our group, the um, Dr. Rosenfarb's AccuVision community. Please post there if you have any questions. Uh, for those of you looking for, for more, we have our, our telehealth con consultations that we're doing, um, our YouTube channel, Dr. Rosenfarb's YouTube channel. If you guys want more, we talked about that earlier, about our patient, patient education talks. Join our Facebook community. Uh, we have books on Amazon. And for those of you guys who uh, missed out earlier on this, we are going to be doing this bi-weekly or twice a month. So every other week on Thursday afternoons, evenings, depending on what part of the world you are, or it could be Friday mornings, uh, we're going to do these bi-weekly bi talks twice a month, uh, the thir every Thursday at 7 o'clock East Coast time. Uh, we may have some changes, and if that is uh, something we do, we'll let you guys know, but we're going to send out emails, so make sure you're on our list. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and call. Um, we are here for you to answer any of your questions, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help you, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care, guys.